to order Tuesday, October 1st at 7.01 p.m. Uh, would everyone please rise for the invocation given by Sarah Lucido, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear God, we are thankful for the many blessings you have given us. Living in the city of East Point, we are surrounded by people who understand and appreciate what sacrifice is all about. We are grateful for their willingness to do what is best for their community. May we keep our residents' sacrifices near our hearts as we make all of our decisions regarding the future of East Point. It is in your name we pray, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're going to start this meeting. We have um, we actually have two presentations, but the first one will be given by our county clerk, Fred Miller, who would like to update us on what is going on with uh, the Macomb County Clerk's Office. Thank you for coming. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I appreciate that. And uh, Council, it's great to be here. And uh, Public of East Point, it's great to be here with you. Um, you have not heard a whole lot about the comparatively about the county clerk's office in the news this year. All I can say is you're welcome. It's a welcome departure from where we are at uh, over the last uh, couple years. And I'm pleased to say that the county clerk's office has done a 180. Um, while I'm uh, as any good politician, I'm happy to take credit for all things, but it really has been a true, true team teamwork. Uh, from the highest levels of county government, from the executive on down, the different branches, as well as the 90 team members there who, who endured such um, difficulties over the time that, um, that the, my predecessor was there and really continued to deliver excellent public service in the face of the, the challenges and having to endure things at work that nobody should have to. But uh, it's a great team of people. I'm making the rounds to all the different communities, the 26 different uh, cities, villages, and townships in Macomb County, and I'm so glad to be here in, in East Point today. Um, I felt my, my wife is actually at East Point, uh, born and raised on Wilson Street, and uh, I felt like I was an East Point resident with all the time I spent here campaigning last, last year, but uh, got, really got a renewed appreciation for what a wonderful city this is, how, uh, as Councilwoman said, uh, all the, the wonderful people and, and the conversations that we have, I'll, I'll carry with me to this day and, and do forward. So just a brief overview, because I'm interested in hearing about the presentations about ranked choice voting as well, but um, as a matter of review, the county clerk's office has four divisions, as I said, made up of 90 people when we're at full staff. Uh, we are the register of deeds whenever you buy or sell a piece of property, a home or a business. In order to register your ownership of that property, you have to register the deed with, uh, with our register of deeds office, which is at 120 North Main in Mount Clemens. We also um, are the election administrator uh, for elections. We work closely with our, our partners at the local level. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, next. We do vital records, which are your birth certificates, death certificates, marriage licenses, concealed pistol licenses, uh, DBA or doing business as registrations, notary applications and the like. Um, and then we are the, the clerk for the court of the 16th Circuit Court in Mount Clemens um, and to run the jury pool. Sorry to say I have no authority to excuse you from jury duty. That's the number one question that I get. Uh, get to know Chief Judge Jim Biernat. He's the one that can excuse you. Um, but we are, we are able to, to offer deferrals for people who have uh, scheduling issues. Um, but um, really, there's no way to get out of jury duty. It's one of those things that uh, is your civic duty. So uh, we see about 102,000 people a year, face-to-face -face transactions. That does not include the 15,000 people that come through the jury room or the, all the thousands of online transactions that we do. Um, I want to bring your attention to two different programs. Uh, you have a green sheet here. I sp passed out some for the public, and there are some in the back if anybody's interested. But uh, because it is a big county, we've reinstituted a program called the, the Mobile Clerk Office. We're going to be at the uh, Roseville East Point Rec Center on Thursday, December 5th. And this is as good as uh, conducting any business with the clerk's office that you would have to otherwise go to downtown Mount Clemens because so many of our transactions involve a face-to-face -face transaction involving verification of identity and whatnot. It's a great service for people in the south end or the north end so you don't have to drive to downtown Mount Clemens. We bring our computers there. We're able to log into the, 
um, state police database to process uh, CPLs. Uh, we do birth records. We register voters, of course. Every, pretty much anything that you can do in downtown Mount Clemens at our offices, you can do that at, at the mobile offices. So, uh, again, that's uh, Thursday, December 5th at the Rec Center. We're also, this Thursday, on October 3rd, we're going to be at the Centerline Public Library. We do about two of these a month. We try to do one south end community and then one north end community and alternate back and forth. The, the Centerline visit on Thursday will be our 12th of the year that we're doing. And then I also want to bring your attention to uh, the other side of the green sheet is our senior hotline. Um, I ran across some data from SEMCOG recently that uh, what, what probably policymakers here will intuitively know, but um, Macomb County is definitely, Southeast Michigan is getting older as a region. Macomb County is, is aging even more rapidly than Southeast Michigan. And they, SEMCOG projects that as of 2015, we have about 90,000 households throughout Macomb County that include somebody who is 65 and older, whether it's a senior living alone, a senior couple, or a senior living with family. It's projected in 25 years, 2045, so it's still a long ways away, but a trend that's emerging. 174,000, which is roughly 46% of all the households in Macomb County will contain somebody who's 65 and older. People are living longer, that's a great thing, um, but to the extent that we can rethink the way we deliver services, whether we're in the private sector, whether we're in the public sector, um, it's gonna help people live independently longer, age in place, that's better for health outcomes, that's better for the public health system, saving taxpayer dollars and the like. So recognizing that the clerk's office is a very, very small piece of that puzzle. Um, we have instituted the senior hotline. Uh, it's a, a dedicated phone number where we have a senior advocate clerk who will answer the phone. Uh, seniors can call up, talk to a human being, get help with any kind of assistance they need with the clerk's office to kind of shepherd them through the process there. We have some limited referral ability to transfer people to services that, they, that might be beyond our purview, but uh, to try and overcome some of that anxiety about whether it be working out their uh, continuity of ownership on their assets through the deeds or uh, trying to secure other vital records are things that we often get from, from seniors, but that's an extra resource uh, for you to help publicize for your constituents as well. So I want to put that before you just briefly about ranked choice voting before we get to the real experts. But I want to say it's been a real pleasure to work with the city um, as we prepare for this historic election coming up for city council in November. Um, we have been for several months now on calls with the Department of Justice, uh, the Bureau of Elections, um, and our colleagues here. And it's been a pleasure to work with Brian, with Kimmy, with Heather, uh, who have really been representing the city uh, very professionally. At the beginning of the process, my colleague, my elections director, uh, Mike Gricks, um, and I, I mean, it was really a kind of a shock to see that this uh, was coming down from the federal judge in the settlement, but it's really been heartwarming to see how at all levels of government, we've kind of come together and figured out how we can make this work. And I'm really, really confident in our ability to run this election. Uh, the, the county clerk is involved on the front end and the back end. As you know, your city clerk and the team run the day of and the absentee voting. Uh, but we help with the programming of the of the uh, tabulators and the uh, voting machines, the printing, and then of course at the end of the night we post the results and work with the board of canvassers to to canvas and and audit the election. Um, I want to let you know, and this is from uh, my the real expert in my office, who's Mike Ricks, our elections director, that we will not be able to like for for the mayor's the mayor's race is separate. That'll be tallied and posted the same as all the other elections, the same as usual. For the city council race, we will not be able to deliver final results on election night. We will be able to post, or we, we're expecting to be able to post the first round of votes. So the, so the number one votes, as they'll go into the process, we'll be able to put some of the raw data up there, but then the actual tallying in the, in the second rounds that will have to be done under the supervision of the Board of Canvassers, which will likely happen on Wednesday, uh, in working in the, the write-ins, turn it back over to the city, who will then ultimately be able to determine the winner. So that's a little bit into the weeds in terms of the operations, but just kind of a snapshot that we are preparing for all eventualities that come out of this new process for all of us. And um, it's really been a great experience and a learning experience as we've been going forward. And it's been great to part partner with the city of East Point. So I'll wrap up my remarks here and just say, um, you know, into the future, um, I'm at your service. Whatever I can do to, to assist you, you and all in your professional responsibilities or the public certainly in pursuing uh, service from the clerk's office, uh, I'm here at your service. So I'm happy to answer any questions or um, sit down and listen to the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from council members? All right. 
moving on, I believe we have a presentation regarding ranked choice voting. I don't know if uh, Mr. Fairbrother, if you'd like to introduce that. Yeah, um, we are delighted to have two experts here today, Ms. Grace Ramsey and Mr. Pedro Hernandez, who will be given uh, a presentation today. And uh, without further ado, thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you so much for having us. It's uh, exciting to see some familiar faces who may be hearing this for the first, second, or even third time. Um, to give a little background before we dive in, uh, my name is Grace Ramsey. Uh, I've been working on educating voters about ranked choice vot voting in jurisdictions where it's being implemented for about seven years now. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be working with the city of East Point to design and execute a voter, voter education program. And I really want to echo um, several of the thoughts that were shared in the last presentation about just how much of a pleasure it's been to, to work with the staff of the city. Um, and it's been really um, inspiring to see how much people have just uh, decided to dive in and, and really taken this on. So just wanted to say that it's been very impressive and I'm excited to continue the work. Yeah, and I'm Pedro Hernandez, uh, Senior Policy Coordinator at FairVote. Um, we have been working with the city and with Grace, uh, providing materials and uh, assisting in the implementation of the voting system. So we are making ourselves available to the city, you know, as it developed its education plan and the implementation of that plan. So um, tonight we're just going to give a pretty brief, uh, kind of a, a abbreviated uh, presentation for what we will be giving. But if you can see on your chairs, we will be giving additional presentations here tomorrow night starting at 7 and at the library at 6 on Thursday. So there will be opportunities for um, going more into the weeds, um, asking more questions, but we really wanted to take the opportunity here just to chat with folks and go through it. So this isn't necessarily the full presentation, but we really wanted to make sure to have this conversation with you. Yep. So this will be part of the presentation um, that will be uh, showing to folks is, you know, the big question is like, why is there a change to our voting system? It comes out of a uh, consent decree between the city of East Point and the Department of Justice. Um, you know, we are, weren't part of, and privy to any of those conversations. We're here simply to educate voters about how, what it means to cast a vote in a ranked choice voting contest and make sure they understand what it means to have rankings and how the vote is counted. So. Uh, this November will be the first time East Point has a ranked choice voting election, which is very exciting. Um, how did elections work before? This is just kind of a graphic to show um, a winner-take-all plurality election. I know that's a lot of words, but essentially it is a citywide contest that elects more than one person under such a configuration. It can be the case that the largest vote getters can capture 100% of the seats. Ranked choice voting allows for a more representative elections. So if you're 25% of the vote, you can have 25% of representation. Everyone has one vote. Everyone's vote weighs the same. Um, but under ranked choice voting, this is a slide. We have a video. Um, but very quickly, I can probably just say, um, in essence, a ranked ballot allows voters to rank their candidates in order of preference. Your first choice will always be the most important uh, choice for your candidate. It'll be the one that you, the candidate you really want to see be elected. Your second choice can be a backup choice and your third choice can be someone you could be happy with and then your fourth choice and so on. So this way everyone's voice is heard. If your first choice candidate can't win because they came in last, perhaps your second choice candidate could also have an opportunity to get your vote. So do you want to show this? I'm screen? a visual learner, so I like videos, so we're going to show a video. One caveat here, this is a video that's used in Minneapolis where they use the same system to elect uh, the at-large seats on their parks board. Sorry to interrupt. Could you speak into the microphone oh, so that the people at home can hear? Thank you. Yeah. We're on? Good. Yes. Okay. So sorry about that. So this is a video that was used in Minneapolis to describe this process for their parks board. I say that ahead of time just because they use slightly different language. So they called this system instant runoff voting. When they say that, they mean ranked choice voting. So with that, we can dive in. We have to hold the microphone close to the computer in order for you to hear the audio. And also flip this. I can make it not show up there. No. No. Uh, how do I get this to show up on the other screen? Oh, drag it over. Oh, there we go. That looks good. Why don't we do that? And do, I'm trying to rewind it. Pardon me. 
Vote for your favorite colors. The instant runoff way. Now with fractions. We already showed you how instant runoff elections work when there's only one winner. But when there's more than one winner, it's a little more complicated. We have five colors to choose from, and we're going to end up with three winners. To start, each voter chooses a favorite color, a second choice, and a third. All right, purple is my first choice, yellow comes in second, and I'll put blue in third place. Now we need a scoreboard. There were 36 votes cast. There will be three winners. In order for a color to win, it needs more than a quarter of the vote. That's because if a color gets that much, then it's mathematically impossible for it to lose. 36 divided by 4 is 9, and we need just over that. So plus 1 is 10. 10 votes is the finish line. Make it there, and you're one of the three winners. So let's count the votes. No one's reached the finish line yet. That means it's time for round two. And orange got the fewest votes, so it's out. Everyone who voted for orange first now gets their second choice. Purple reached the finish line. In fact, purple has more votes than it needs. That means each purple voter can take back a fraction of their vote and still leave purple with enough to win. Under instant runoff rules, that's exactly what they get to do. Purple has two votes to spare. And that gets divided among the 12 purple voters. So each of them gets one-sixth of their vote back. And that little piece will go to their next choice. Now blue has reached the finish line. No votes to spare. So, so no, no more fractions. fractions. Green is in last place. You know the drill. Most of these votes are for colors that have already won or are already out. We call those ballots exhausted. Yellow didn't quite make it to the finish line, but there's no one else left. So we have our three winners. The instant runoff way. Let's go back to this, right? All right, so for the purposes of this election, I hope that that was a helpful explanation, but we're gonna kind of take it back to the beginning and walk through it again. Oh. Hi there, Ad. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so for our purposes, we're gonna take it back from the beginning and then build it up. Um, and this is a lot of what we'll be talking about and really slow walking through the process because this is different for the voters. Um, so this is similar to what your ballot's gonna look like, not exactly because you're not ranking um, potential things to eat for lunch. You're gonna be ranking candidates this year. But as you can see on this ballot, you're gonna indicate your choices under those numbers. So under the one, you're gonna indicate your first choice, your favorite candidate, the person you really love. Maybe uh, you donated to their campaign or knocked on doors for them, but that's really the person that you really wanna support. And then with your second choice, the way you think about that is if that candidate can't win, and I still wanna be factored in on this election, I still want my voice to be heard, who's my next favorite candidate? Um, I think this is a thought process that we actually use very often in our lives. Um, it's just a different application of that. So a good example is a few weeks ago I went to the movies with a friend and we did not buy tickets ahead of time because it was a spur of the moment decision. And when we got there, the movie we wanted to see was sold out. I really was craving popcorn. I was already there, drove all the way. I decided I still wanted to see a movie that day. So we looked at the list of movies and decided what our second favorite was and we went to that movie, right? And there are obviously more high stakes decisions we use this for, whether it's choosing um, places to go to college or whatever it may be. Uh, we do think this way a lot. We're just applying it in a different way. But for the voter, the main thing that we need folks to walk away knowing, or at least walk into the, uh, into the voting booth knowing, is that you are able to rank your preferences in order of choice, as many or as few as you have. But with that, I think there's some questions that tend to spring up pretty quickly. So we will run through the ones that we hear most often, and we want to make sure that you all have the chance to ask the questions that you may have, especially at our forums tomorrow and um, Thursday, but also in whatever ways you need to. They can be relayed to us, and we're happy to have those conversations. So first, how many candidates do you rank? As many or as few as you'd like. 
If you feel very strongly about one person and one person alone, you are welcome to just rank that candidate. The issue is if they don't have enough support to be elected, you've then lost your chance to have that conversation. It's kind of like showing up to a primary election and then not showing up in the general, right? And a lot of times we still want to have that conversation and say what we would like to see for our city. So as many or as few, you are not forced to do anything here. We just think it, it may be in voters' interest to consider the option of ranking. Do you have to rank everyone? Again, you will not be forced to do anything that you don't want to do. Um, I think all of us have been in the situation where we see the name of a candidate uh, on a ballot that we just don't want to vote for. I wouldn't encourage you to vote for somebody that you don't like in that situation and wouldn't encourage you to do that in any situation. So if there's somebody that you simply don't want to rank, you do not have to. Um, it doesn't hurt your favorite candidate to indicate further choices, but again, if it's up to you as the voter. You're not being forced um, to do this. We just think it may be in your interest too. Oh, yeah. Wrong way, dang it, I had it. All right, can I rank a candidate more than once? So this gets a little bit tricky. I think sometimes people think because you're ranking candidates, if you rank the same candidate more than once, you're somehow supercharging your vote for them. Uh, ranking the same candidate more than once is essentially the same as ranking them just one time. Right? So it doesn't help them anymore. It just means that if for any reason they're eliminated from the race, we don't know what your next preference was. Right? So we have nowhere for that ballot to go if that person can't win. Um, so it doesn't help them anymore. While it, is, it can you know, seemingly be a strong show of support, it won't count that way. Your vote will count for one, one time on that first choice for that candidate. And then finally, does it hurt my favorite candidate to have a second choice? No. Your vote is going to stay with that candidate as long as they are in the race, right? So they've either been elected and you did exactly what you meant to do, which was help elect that favorite candidate, or they've been eliminated. And you can't help them win anymore, right? They didn't have enough support. So in that case, a second choice is only helping if that candidate can't use your vote anymore. Oh, I'm going to go back and then flip to that. Um, so a lot of people are probably familiar with like the single seat version of ranked choice voting. The state of Maine is using it. Uh, there are a number of jurisdictions and cities across the country using it. And the threshold or the amount of votes you need to win under a single seat vote for one ranked choice voting is 50% plus one. That number is 50% plus one because it's mathematically impossible for another person to have that same amount, right? When we're electing two people under ranked choice voting, that number, that 50% plus one goes down to uh, when you're electing two to a third plus one because it's mathematically impossible for a third person to have that many votes. So this November, that will be the winning number for these candidates who are running this election. First one to a third will win. Um, but I have this graphic to just kind of show what the thresholds are. This is, the yellow looks really bad. And, but essentially vote, you know, number of seats up for election, for one it's 50% plus one, for two it's a third plus one. For three, it's 25% plus one. And for four, it's 20% plus one. Um, in this style of election, uh, this formula, it's called, in math terms, the Droop quota um, is how you get to it. It's uh, probably been in existence for over 100 years. Actually, America has a long tradition of using this style of election. Um, and this isn't very new, but it is new for people today. So just want to flag that, but that is the fairest amount of votes necessary to win that's the lowest amount because you can say we're electing two so it should be like half well actually you don't really need half <coughs> you can actually go down um, and this is um, what the ballot looks like in, in a larger photo uh, as you can see uh, people will be able to make their first choice and their second choice third choice and fourth choice on uh, this November's ballot there are going to be I believe four candidates on the ballot and a space for a writing candidate. Um, um, so the way it works, right? So uh, we count everyone's first choices. If someone has a third, they would win. Here's an example where no one has a third. So what do we do? Anyone have a guess? Grace. You eliminate the candidate with the fewest votes. That's right. So here it's this uh, lighter shade of uh, uh, lavender. We that that candidate is defeated and then we count the votes for that candidate for those voters second choices um, here we would have two winners um, if 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 that were if if the two leading candidates were close enough to that threshold um, we can have another situation where a candidate has more votes than they need and that was that part in the video that I feel most people were like what is that um, 
So you can have a situation, well, the point of a ranked ballot is to make sure that no one's vote is wasted. So if you vote for a very popular candidate, we shouldn't punish you for voting for someone who's very popular. Your vote should be able to count for a second choice. Um, so we make sure that your vote isn't wasted because it only takes a third to win, you get a piece of your vote back. So what that looks like, it is basically say you have, your vote is worth a dollar, but the candidate you, that won only needed 90 cents of your dollar, those 10 cents can apply for a second choice. Everyone still has the value of one vote, but this way we make sure that, you know, majorities are majorities and we still allow people to reach a fair threshold for being elected. Um, so it could be the case that, oh yeah, here purple is elected and then that surplus, that extra amount of votes can be counted for second choices. Um, and you can have your winners that way. Now, I'm not too crazy about this next graphic. Actually, the handout, the voter information handout that we've created and developed for Eastpoint, I think is a little more clear than this next one. But basically, this is a summation or a summary of what can happen. Ranked choice voting ballots are counted by rounds, right? So there was that round one where someone had more than they, could, that they needed, and then we count that extra part of votes for, the, for those second choices, and if no one has uh, has re ha reaches that threshold or there's still seats to be filled, we can eliminate the candidates who come in last. Um, how does ranked choice voting uh, change elections? Grace. So in the places where this is used, I'm gonna go through quickly because we just want you to know how to use your ballots, but we've seen that voters are allowed to have more choices without being punished for that, right? You can rank that first choice candidate and still have that backup choice, but you aren't betraying your favorite by doing that, right? You're able to rank those choices and they work. We've seen a lot more civil campaigning under systems like this, just because if you're asking somebody for a second choice vote, it's pretty unlikely that you're gonna tell them that their first choice candidate is somebody not worth liking, right? You wanna respect people's choices, but also present your platform to as many voters as possible, right? Because every vote's on the table. Um, again, we're not seeing vote splitting. Let's say two people wanna run from the same neighborhood, they're not gonna split the vote from that neighborhood, right? Because those voters can rank them in order instead of having to pick one over the other. And as we've seen, it gives you this, this representation where the majority isn't shutting out um, another part of the population. And I'll add one more part. If you go back to that slide, um, when you're electing two people, it's a, a third plus one to win. At the end of election night, you will have two thirds of your city represented, meaning two thirds will have someone who speaks for them at City Hall. So for the voters, the most important thing we need you to know is that when you go to vote on November 5th, or if you send in your lovely absentee ballot, or however you are going to be showing up and speaking out on election day, you are able to rank that ballot. That is the main thing that we need you to know. Um, I personally am not a math person in any kind of way. Uh, it goes right over my head. But for me, I've gotten to a place where this makes sense, but mostly I know that when I cast my vote, I'm ranking those choices and it's going to perform in the way that I want it to, where I know that I'm gonna help my first choice get elected unless they're not in the race anymore. So we are running a, uh, some programming in East Point that I wanna quickly go through and then we will get out of your way and I really encourage anybody who may be confused to come to our presentations tomorrow. We'll have a lot more time. We can definitely take a lot of questions. But we wanna make sure that we're getting this message out to as many people as possible. In a lot of the cities where they're using ranked choice voting, the most important thing for a voter is to see a ballot. Um, I found uh, it was pretty intuitive the first time I saw one, and I kind of didn't get it, to be honest with you, the first time I heard about it. So I think seeing that ballot was really helpful for me to know what I needed to do. So a few things that we're doing just to run through, educating voters obviously is important, um, but we have created this flyer that we'll be handing out. Um, this is going to be in uh, local newspapers. This is going to be something that we're giving to um, the recreation center or senior centers or senior homes, wherever it may be, but we really wanna reach out to as many people as possible, whether that's local businesses, whether it's local organizations, whoever that may be, to make sure that they have access to this and can give it out to the people that they're interacting with. Uh, we're also going to be mailing something very similar to the voters um, several times, just to make sure that that message is, is getting delivered. 
Um, and then we're also doing um, a digital media campaign as well. So if, as you may have seen, um, Heather from the city of East Point is absolutely fantastic at her job and has been posting a lot about this on social media. We have developed a website. It's uh, www.voteeastpoint.com uh, where you can get all sorts of information. So there's uh, frequently asked questions. There's an in-depth explanation of what this looks like. And then hopefully soon we want to be launching um, an interactive ballot where voters can practice this, but in a low stakes lunch situation, uh, not with candidates, uh, but just to get that practice of what it's going to look like. I think uh, the mailers and other things will give them that practice of knowing what it looks like if you want to practice voting with your lunch choices and then maybe think through it with candidates as well. But we want to provide people with as many opportunities as possible to engage with these materials before Election Day. From there, we are going to be doing direct voter education. If I have not said this enough times, I'm going to say it again. We're going to do another presentation about ranked choice voting here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, and then another um, Thursday at the East Point Library at 6 o'clock. Um, we're hoping to continue this uh, throughout the rest of the campaign season. This is what we have scheduled so far, but we really want to make sure that we are presenting as many people as possible the opportunity to come in and learn about this and ask their questions. I think change can be really difficult, and I think having the space to really come forward with what may be concerning folks is, is really important. In addition to that, we are reaching out to folks in the community. So we've been talking to the folks at the high school about educating those seniors who may be able to vote this year. Um, the League of Women Voters put on a candidate forum, which I heard was excellent last week. And we're also talking with them since they often put out things like voter guides. So we're really making sure that anybody who's going to be talking to the community about the election is getting that education piece out there. Because we want to make sure that any conversation about the election itself is, included, um, is including uh, voter education in that. And that is all we have for you tonight. So we can take questions now, or we're more than happy to talk to everybody tomorrow and Thursday. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Does anyone on council have any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. And at this point, we'll move on to roll call. Please call the roll. Councilperson DeMonico? Here. Councilperson Lacido? Yeah, here. Councilperson Kleinfeld? Here. Uh, Councilperson Owens is absent, and Mayor Pixley is also absent. Thank you. Moving on to approval of the agenda. Would anyone like to make a motion? All right. I'll motion to approve the agenda. Support. Moved by Mr. DeMonico, supported by Sarah Lucido. Please call the roll. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. Councilperson Lucido? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld. Yes. Moving on to hearing of the public, would anyone wish to be heard? All right. Ms. Simmons? Christine Timmon, new resident of East Point, and I just heard a very creepy dissertation on government overreach and government oppression. When you read your Civil Rights Act of 64, you can't advantage anybody because of the race or whatever. Because I heard them say, oh, this is going to help colored people and, and women to get elected. The government can't do that. It's supposed to be up to the people. People, especially when you're new somewhere, make yourself known. Be a person of quality. I got to Detroit Edison as a steno and left there, ran the engineering department for all 36 of the engineers, including Burkhardt, Snyder, and Walker P. Sisler. I've been getting a check for 50 years now. I ain't been nowhere near it. You make yourself known. When I got sick from that job, I read all the time. Now I'm an attorney. I'm a pro se litigant private attorney general. I was the one to help bring down Obama. It's all about the person. The government can't make you into something that you're not. And the person who started, she ain't even here. She ain't even here. I, over the weekend, I watched things like this from way back when our country began. Brown, Brown, and the abolitionists. I'm waiting on them to come riding up now. This is all unnecessary. I, I, I mean, the money that it costs, you know, and, and not only the money, it's the emotion that goes with it. I'm thinking I'm moving to a nice little city, you know, and the next thing I hear somebody them brought down the, the strong arm of the racial justice and all that, and now the government going to mess with our votes. Oh, God. Oh. 
it's this the worst thing I ever seen, but you guys go ahead and do this. But I'm telling people you don't have to. When I go in there, I know who I'm going to vote for for council. I ain't doing all that break, all that mess. That's how you get your stuff messed up. And don't be surprised. You heard him say it's historic. Don't be surprised if some people don't want to know where their vote actually went. We don't know what's going to happen. I'm just sorry that that woman didn't think that she was woman enough to be on her own and get to be where she is. I have awards from two presidents and Engler and Bessie DeVos and Congress. I got a whole lot of stuff going on. And I'm only a sixth grade graduate from way back in the day. It doesn't take all this stuff what y'all are doing. And the final thing I'm going to say, I don't want to hear, when I be in here, please do not say anything about no hundred years of, of institutionalized You have racism. 30 seconds. Because that's not true anymore. The last 50 years of racism was not white institutionalized racism. I had to live in it. It was black institutionalized racism. They get welfare checks, don't work. Screw the government. Anything happen? Just, oh my God, I'm black. I'm so sick of that. You know. And then I had to move right into it. I don't know when I'm gonna ever get any rest. Thank you. Would anyone else wish to be heard? Hi. <clears throat> Hello. My name is Ron Klobuchar. Um, I just paid off my 15-year mortgage for probably 16, 17 years residence. I live at 16243 Owens. Back my property is Sparks and Summers parking lot. When they decided to go into the trash hauling business, basically they expanded their parking lot onto city property with no permits, no nothing or nothing, and using back my garage basically retaining wall for the parking lot. They broke so many codes and laws, I don't know. And so many times I try to get hold of the building department and everything, nobody seems to care. Then even on over here, they had 10 different vehicles and trailers back there. Usually it costs 80, 90 dollars a month to total that. So basically the city's, you know, tens of thousands of dollars they're getting in storage fees. And really, I really don't know what to do. Basically the building department or planning or whatever basically cited them last August 3rd of 18 to restore the property to uh, what it was before. And nothing happened, nothing's going on. And just to get a, a reply from them, I think I sent three different certified letters, registered letters, and I finally got something three or four weeks ago, this in, in the mail. and. Um, Basically, it's not right what they did. They're building on city property for nothing, for free. So I don't want to take up all your time and these people's time whining and crying. So basically, I made a little thing of the letters I got showing the map that it is city property and go from there. I really don't know what else to do. May I approach you guys? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry, there's a few months more. I'm still That's okay. Slow. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you. Would anyone else wish to be heard? Mr. Creech? Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. The few things that I want to address, as I said, under the Code of Ordinance, the City of East Point, version September, September 25th of 2019, it says the Director of Public Safety. And then, on, but the worst part of this, as I said, is not to be revised, shall consist of chief of each of such offices, fire and police. We don't have a chief of fire and police. We have a deputy. We've had deputies for I don't know how long. Some, some things, I don't understand it anymore. As, as much as I come in front of the city and, and, and other people come, especially like this gentleman who just come up in front of me. Some things have to be addressed. And, and these things have to be addressed. If we're just gonna have a, chief, a deputy, that's fine. But our ordinances, 
There, there's so many things in version that doesn't come up and doesn't get addressed. Maybe I addressed too many of them, but I said, it's just one after another. And I'm, I'm, I'm not even trying to get into it. I dropped off some papers to Mr. Albright today just for him to look at some of those. And, and I said, uh, you know, the chief of the fire department or person in charge. We don't have a chief. Who's, who's in charge? The deputy chief? I mean, I, I'm just reading. And it said right here, there shall be a city assessor and also assistant city manager. I see that we, we finally got an assistant city manager, but we hire an assessor. I don't understand this. All these things that I've, I've been reading for the last two or three days, 105 pages, and there's a lot of paperwork in there and a lot of things that should be going through, and I understand that, well, there again, too, as I said, you, you are people of choice, and the people put you in, in the seat you're in. And I've said the same thing about it. And I understand this. I'm running for mayor. I don't know a lot of this stuff, but the more I read, the more I get disgruntled. I shouldn't be disgruntled. And, and if, the, if the people of the city actually get a chance to read this, they might be disgruntled too. Because in the circumstance, circumstances, especially, I say, this gentleman, why does he have to come in front of you when we have nine? You have 30 seconds. Thank you. We have nine code enforcers. And I understand it takes 90 days to get anything done. And I see what we have to go through. I, I even addressed some of this in, in the last issue. Maybe it's time, it, as I said before, too, even in the rank choice and the rest of the stuff, I'm not for it. We have to pay for it, and maybe we can get around it. But please, take a look at some of our incidents. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pro Tem uh, Mayor and uh, Council. Uh, my name is Larry Edwards, uh, East Point Residence. Uh, I'm here, first of all, for a reoccurring uh, situation that I've, this is my third time coming to address, and that is uh, in regards to uh, trees not being trimmed in residence and uh, uh, it's, it's a joke to try and call public works to get a uh, uh, response. There is no answer, uh, as well as uh, uh, you leave a message and there is no response to it. And uh, I know uh, residents and citizens can attest to this here because I hear it all the time. And I've been doing this for some time. Uh, I used to be able to uh, uh, get through with Barbara. Uh, uh, but she's no longer there. I can't think of her last name. Uh, I also see uh, there are some uh, candidates' uh, signs and yards, uh, in particular where I'm talking about. Uh, but shame on you, you know, nothing's being done. We can walk by this stuff and it don't even phase us. We could care less uh, because it's not yours and what have you. So why would it phase you? Why would you care? And whatever, but I have in front of my house uh, trees that's uh, tree limbs that's falling down on children. Well, didn't actually hit the ch the, the the children. It just did miss them falling down because there's a lot of dead limbs and what have you. Uh, used to be uh, uh, there's uh, three trees uh, that set the curve now of where I live. Uh, it used to be uh, before I moved there, uh, just about every every house on the on, uh, uh, with the curve had a, had a tree there. They have cut cut them down. I don't think mines need to be cut down, but I know it do definitely need to be trimmed. Uh, the tree, the kind of trees that they put up there in front of my house uh, 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 to, to keep it survival uh, has to be only treated, supposed to be only treated during the fall. This is fall now. This is the third time I'm coming back up here for this and whatever. And I don't think it makes any sense. I hear nobody saying anything about it. Nobody comes to me. Nobody replies and what have you. But I got to keep going over this same thing over and over. There is no, there is no communication. I don't care what people say in these campaigns and in these uh, forums and what have you. It's a joke. 
and what have you. And uh, 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 most people know what politics is about. And when they call, when people, certain people call themselves politics, uh, uh, politicians. Seconds. And the other thing, uh, with the ranked choice voting, how did it only get to be for the, for the city council and not for everybody that's running as a candidate? Uh, I would like to know that as well and what have you. So uh, that seems uh, uh, very interesting and suspicious to me indeed and what have you. So uh, uh, that'll be all. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else wish to be heard? Anyone else wish to be heard? Seeing none, the hearing of the public is closed and we'll move on to approval of the minutes. Can I get a motion regarding the regular meeting from September 17th? Mayor, um, Mayor Pro Tem, I motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of September 17th, 2019. I'll support that. All right, please call the roll. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. We have no scheduled hearings or unfinished business, so we'll move on to reports from administration. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, First, uh, Mr. Edwards, uh, the ball is in my court. Uh, I've been told that the tree in question, uh, we, we did discuss it after the last uh, time that you presented that, uh, it is not a city tree. I want to go by it and look at it personally. It's, and I've been out of town, so it's for two weeks I've been wanting to get there, um, and I haven't. So w would you please do me a favor and make sure I have the correct address um, with Mr. Fairbrother before you leave, as well as the phone number. Um, and I'll personally address that. And uh, like I said, it was my responsibility at this juncture, so thank you. Uh, second, uh, we, uh, Joe Marucci, I think, is uh, present. I would like to ask him to give you an update on something that's near and dear to all your hearts. I, I spoke to the uh, ABLE Electronics representative, Mark, Mark Monarch, this afternoon. In fact, it was late this uh, afternoon, and he mentioned that the uh, PA system at the press box over at Memorial Field is 99% complete. It's actually operational. They just have to do a little bit of fine-tuning on it, and then they will finish that tomorrow, and then there will probably be a little bit of training. So he uh, came through with the, promise, the written promise that he made, uh, and the system will be operational for Friday night. In fact, it will be operational for tomorrow night. And he checked it out. He said it's incredible how good it is. Thank you, Ms. Marucci. Uh, I want to make a couple other comments, if I may. Um, we have uh, an anniversary to celebrate, at least we're celebrating uh, internally here, and that's uh, Public Safety Director Rauhib. He's been here a year, and so we want to congratulate him on a, on a very busy year of service, and I think you have a report that is uh, extends six pages long as to what types of activities he and his team have undergone, and uh, as far as I can tell, all successfully. So thank you, Council, for your support. Some of the ideas originated with you that he's worked on, and I think that's the way the system should work. Um, I want to announce that the uh, city manager recruitment um, period has uh, come. As, as of midnight last night, we had 37 applications. Uh, that was the deadline, the posted deadline. Uh, however, if the perfect person is still out there, we, we certainly will always uh, uh, entertain that. Uh, we do have some very good people. Uh, so I have in front of you a list as to the process that is expected from this point forward. It looks like this. And I do want to take a minute to go through it. Um, everything in yellow uh, looks like dates, would be ideally dates that the council would have special meetings for. Um, recognize that there'll be some changes in faces on the council, and so we don't, won't set these dates, or actually we won't know for sure who's gonna be at these meetings, but November 14th would be a good time to have a special council meeting to discuss 10 to 12 of the highest uh, ranked candidates, and then on November 20th, 21st, first interviews, um, three to nine, and the November 25th and November 26th, second interviews. These dates could change, of course, based on the, the, the council as once it's seated on November 11th, but I wanted you to know at least it's a draft calendar. Uh, what is in blue represents optional uh, discussions that the council, uh, or special things the council will need to know. On the 14th, that would be a closed session because uh, applicants have requested confidentiality. On the 21st, um, I'm recommending that we uh, conclude what's known as a Colby Method Work Profile Assessment 
Yeah, it's something that we used when we hired Director Rauhib, and I just mentioned everything that's, that's happened. Um, once this system is used, um, one county in the state, anyway, Ottawa County, uses it exclusively for when they make any hires. I used it on occasion. You'll get this. And what it does, I want to just explain, is it, it, you all, as council, will participate, so that's why I'm going into this detail. Each color means a way that you uh, work or that you appreciate in relation to information flow or what you expect in terms of uh, procedure. And without going through all the detail, uh, the process then ranks our, our highest candidates. You'll interview as well, of course, two interviews, but it'll also give you an assessment as to how they'll work with the styles that you all have working together as a team. So it's scientific, it's been around for decades, and um, I found that it works well and I would like to do that. Um, lastly, uh, we had um, open house the last time for the community to come in and meet the finalists and get feedback and, and ask questions. I'd also like to suggest a community tour that, that staff would handle uh, for the candidates this time around. So those things are in blue and I just wanted you to know that there's some um, background to why I'm making those recommendations. In advance of all that, there's things that, that we as the consulting firm does, uh, once again, at no cost to you, no extra cost to you, because um, you know, this is what our, what our guarantee is. Um, I'm a representative of GovHR when I say those words, uh, which is the consulting firm that I work for as a temporary employee, as you know. I'll pause there and see if you have any questions before I move to the next item. Okay. Uh, the next recruitment was your highest priority was to get an economic development manager in place. That application period is open until um, this Thursday. We're presently at uh, 22 applications um, and uh, we have some good candidates there as well. Oh, <clears throat> I'm going to jump back to city manager for a second. I just remembered at the top here, uh, the city council, uh, there's a, a, a criteria in the charter that we need one year of experience as a city manager, assistant city manager, and nine meet that minimum criteria. Nine who f appear otherwise qualified meet that criteria. There are eight additional more that otherwise appear qualified that do not meet that charter criteria. That charter criteria is not something, of course, every town has. Very few towns have, and so that's on the, the ballot this, uh, this fall. And that's one reason we need to wait till after the election to know whether those eight can be considered or not. I'd like to actually comment on that. Have we, I don't think we have, um, done anything to put out any informational uh, um, brochures or, or pamphlets with the water bill or say, just to inform residents on what that charter amendment is and what it does? Because um, I, I think, uh, Unless you're familiar with some of the issues that we've run into or why we put that on the ballot, um, I think we might need to make some efforts to make residents aware of what that is on the, and why that is on the ballot. Excellent suggestion. There has not been anything formal other than what you've talked about here in front of the cameras. Uh, so we'll work on that. I, I think I'll uh, interface a little bit with uh, Attorney Albright to make, to make certain that uh, it's, it needs to be informational in nature. I want to make sure we stay um, in that regard. So. Thank you. Okay, economic development manager. Uh, once again, uh, we'll have a, um, an internal process that will review that. Uh, and I, we have some uh, people I'm recruiting external as well to be part of that process. And we hope to bring you some candidates towards the end of the month. Actually, not bring you, announce who is the best candidate. Um, that we would like to hire and will be hiring. I will be using the Colby system for that also um, because of our good experience, as I mentioned. I have um, <clears throat> two more announcements, three more announcements. Uh, it was, we were asked questions about the camera, which is on your agenda later today, about uh, whether those are replacement cameras for the ones purchased in 2015. And I meant to get an email out. I didn't get to that today. They are not replacement cameras for those. It's replacement cameras for much older cameras. And our director of, um, can explain that more if we, get, if we need to. America Cleaning was here last week, uh, two weeks ago, and asked about bills that were unpaid. Um, there are two things that are of concern. One was there was an uh, allegation that there were, there were current bills that were not paid. We have 
tracked those down, they were paid, not only paid, but they were cashed. So there's no, no remaining issue with that, and there wasn't one at that time. However, there is a dispute over the amount of hours spent cleaning the public safety department and uh, whether they should be paid for the hours clocked in or they should be paid for more hours than what were clocked in. And that, um, that is what we are not inclined as staff to, to, to make payment for hours that were not worked. So uh, we, they will be getting information in that regard. I'm not sure, maybe they're watching tonight. Um, I received that report today and, and they'll probably want to vote, um, excuse me, meet and discuss it and we'll, um, and we'll go from there. But we, we do not believe that that 3,000 some dollars is owed. I thought, so when I looked at the contract, I thought it essentially had the bidders originally bid a yearly cost and if they did it in less hours than estimated or whatnot, whatever they needed to do, we still paid them the same amount of money, just monthly. That's how I read the contract. Um, I, I recognize that there can be different readings of contracts. Is that right, uh, Mr. Attorney? I've never um, heard of such a thing. <clears throat> <laughs> However, there were discussions with the former city manager, with the, the cleaning contractor, to, to uh, remedy any misunderstanding. And, uh, and, and, and so there shouldn't be any misunderstanding at this point. Um, nevertheless, um, I have not personally read that contract, so I will do so. Um, yeah, because I, I read the contract also, and the way I read the contract is the same way that Mr. DeMonico interpreted the contract. Um, and when it might be something to maybe even have Mr. Albright review and see what his interpretation of it is. Good suggestion. Last item. DBW is at hard at work. Um, they give me a report every week, and I, just, I was pleased to see that they're replacing old and faded signs. So if you have a favorite old and faded sign that needs to be retired um, that hasn't been replaced, uh, feel free, anyone, to let us know. Denominate one, and, and we'll take care of that one, too. Thank you. All right. Any questions for Mr. Cotton? Uh, do we have a finance report tonight, or...? All right, moving on to a report from the city attorney, Mr. Albright. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld. Um, as the council is aware, there are uh, three um, ordinance amendments on the agenda for council's consideration uh, this evening. Uh, these um, ordinance amendments were requested by the uh, police department <clears throat> and for members of the public. The first one uh, amends the municipal civil infraction uh, ordinance that uh, has been on the books now for uh, several years and it adds a provision uh, which is entitled anti-smoke regulations and for members of the public I'll just read it. it says no person shall create cause or maintain any nuisance within the city by an unreasonable creation of dust smoke fly ash or nox noxious odors offensive or disturbing to adjacent property owners and residents of the area this would be a municipal civil infraction it would allow uh, a police officer to uh, issue a citation to a person who is in violation of this particular ordinance uh, section. It would, uh, if the person was found responsible, it would result in a $350 fine uh, payable over at the uh, 38th District Court. Uh, that person uh, would also have uh, a right to a hearing if they decided to uh, plead uh, not responsible and the judge would then conduct a hearing. So that uh, would amend the municipal civil infraction ordinance. Uh, the second ordinance amendment uh, amends the city's nuisance ordinance and what this would provide for if there is a particular location in the city or a person um, uh, is continually violating um, and creating noxious odors and smoke, it would allow the city attorney's office to file an injunction action in the um, circuit court to obtain an injunction against that property owner or person that would be in violation of that ordinance. And finally, um, uh, the, there is an ordinance amendment regarding um, uh, persons who leave their firearms uh, unattended in motor vehicles. Um, uh, I've been informed by the police department that this has been a growing problem that people are leaving uh, firearms in cars that are unlocked. Uh, people that are in possession of a CPL are leaving these, uh, these firearms and the vehicles are broken into and then those firearms are stolen and uh, who knows what happens with them. But, that would make a violation uh, of that uh, a civil infraction as well, subject to a $350 fine. Uh, it's also on a graduated scale, so if uh, the person received 
a uh, second violation that would elevate uh, the charge to a misdemeanor. And so those are uh, the three amendments that are in front of the uh, City Council this evening. I've also been in contact with the City's Animal Control Officer who is requesting uh, several amendments to the City's Animal Ordinance. I did meet with him approximately two weeks ago and we've come to an agreement on uh, the language uh, for uh, several of those amendments. Uh, what I plan on doing is putting those amendments in ordinance form and not initially bringing them as an agenda item, but I'll distribute those to the council members for review and then we could uh, discuss that at a, at a later council meeting and once there's a consensus as to uh, what should be, uh, what amendments should be made, then I'll put those uh, uh, in ordinance form for purposes of an agenda item. So. And Council's in receipt of our monthly status report. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions uh, the Council may have. Any questions for Mr. Albright? Thank you. All right, moving on to new business. Item A, approval to purchase high-definition security cameras. Uh, could I get a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I motion to approve the quotable from Able Electronics for the purchase of high definition security camera and to waive competitive bidding. Yeah, I'll support that. But if we could discuss this really briefly, I guess my two questions at this point after what Mr. Cotton said then earlier would just be, um, is this the rest of the cameras that are getting upgraded then or are there still some left? Be because that'd be good to know. And then can we utilize or have we asked the opinion of our IT firm about this that we just hired? <clears throat> I'll introduce this and turn it over to Director Rauhib. Um, I, I, it will not, I don't believe, um, handle every single other camera. It does include a server. And you know how when you look at um, uh, pictures of crime scenes and, and Speedway gas station, I, I shouldn't say that name, you know how it's kind of flickering? That's a problem we'll have that this will correct. Uh, Director Rauhe? Yes, thank you, Mr. Cotton. Um, right now we have, we have 35 cameras within the, the police department, interior, exterior, property rooms. Um, Typically, when you have this many cameras, they should be on a replacement schedule, and that's something that I'm going to work on. Back in 2015, there was a number of cameras that were purchased, but they were adding cameras to the system, and a lot of those cameras, uh, those went to the court. Uh, right now, the cameras that we're replacing, the eight, they're analog cameras, and uh, we want, uh, this will provide us with high-definition cameras. You have faster frame rates. The quality of the picture would be probably three times better, and we're going to get a new server that can store, you know, additional uh, footage. And you know, these cameras are great because it's not only to protect the prisoners, but it's to protect our officers. And we also have uh, Macomb County Sheriff deputies and our court officers. They walk in the lockup area, which is the highest risk area, and we want as many cameras in there as possible, and we want to capture as many things as possible. Um, from talking to everybody there, the majority of the cameras after this replacement, they're in pretty good shape. I don't think we're going to be coming in front of council for a couple years. Um, we are getting a partial grant. The total price for this is uh, 27835 and some change. We're getting a grant from our insurance carrier of 9278 So the total cost is going to be 18557 <coughs> And we selected Able Electronics because they're... They are our current vendor. They know the history of the system. They do all the troubleshooting. They know all the wiring. And we're getting uh, 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 the governmental rate on this, so. So you said we have 35 cameras total right now? We have 35 cameras in the, within, the, within the police department. That's including exterior, interior, and the basement area. And we honestly, we could use more. You never can have enough cameras, but for now, this 35 will suffice. We'll still have 35. Yes, the majority yeah. are in. Once we replace this batch, we should be good for at least two, three, maybe four years. Why are we buying 49 licenses then? Well, there's different. That number is off. It, it shouldn't be 49. It should be 35. That's something that uh, we have to work out with Able Electronics, but. Uh, 
each area that can monitor the cameras has to have a, a specific license or a separate license, but that number that number is off. Well, I mean, is there labor? Is probably based on how many cameras, then, right? Everything. Well, a lot of other things are probably based on how many cameras. I think their labor is based on what they quoted us the eight cameras, the server, all the supplies. There's training involved. Um, the license part is separate. So right, but I mean, if they, uh, I mean, where? So how many are they replacing? They're replacing eight cameras for uh, Sally Ports, the booking room, and the hallways to the booking room. So there's there's total of eight. They're all analog cameras we're replacing with high definition cameras with a new server. So why would we even need to buy 35 new licenses? The current cameras are probably licensed, right? I guess when you buy when you purchase a new camera per se. I guess you have to buy, you have to have separate licenses for all of them yeah. for the new server system. So where does it say the eight, I guess, new cameras? I see it's, there's eight It should camera. be on the, uh, uh, let's see here. I need some glass. Yes, four and four. It should be on the first, the first page of the uh, quote. Okay, so the four and the toward the bottom, it says four and four. Yeah. And so it says it identifies the Sally Port and booking and the, in the uh, hallway cameras. So we're not adding any to the system. We're just. We're just trying to upgrade the ones that are outdated. So those eight are analog, and then they'd be? High definition. OK. And then how many left would not be high definition? Well, I think the majority of them are all high definition. I, I think this would probably cover it. I mean, the other cameras are a little bit older, but uh, they're all in good shape. And if they need repair, we just repair them. But, uh, um, I mean, since I've been here, we haven't had too many issues with the cameras, just minor issues. Okay. Yeah, because in 2015, what we did was we added 13 IP cameras, which is the digital high def that you're Correct. talking about as opposed to analog. Correct. And then so, I don't know how many we had before that, I guess, and then 8 would make 21. I guess I'd want to know if the other 14 are... High def, I don't want to just run into the same problem. And again, we need to buy some more high right. def because especially it's obviously very important to have very good cameras at, at the PD. The main areas are the main area the main areas, excuse me, are covered with the high definition. The, the most the area of risk is the lockup. That's where we want, you know, the highest quality equipment in that area, because that's where, you know, prisoners sometimes they say that they were uh, Abused by the police officers, and mm -hmm. sometimes the when you have a when an analog camera, you have slower rate of speed. It's not depicting what actually really happened with these types of cameras. It would be a lot clearer, and um, and that's just, just the way it you know technology is. I mean, everyone's going high definition, so and so we can't utilize. I mean, does did our IT firm help put this together? This what we need. No, Able Electronics came out. They're very familiar with the system. They know the system inside and out. And I also met with our insurance carrier, a gentleman that uh, he specializes in lockup areas, and he also made recommendations. And we sat down, and this is how we came up with this proposal, you know, with Able Electronics. Well, I was just asking because I mean we're almost paying 200k a year for an IT firm. Seems like wouldn't this be an exact Example of something they could install. I mean, maybe we buy the equipment from Abel, but why wouldn't they in install it? Why was that not? Uh... I don't even think. I mean, sometimes it takes four or five days just to get somebody out to look at your computer when it's down. Mm -hmm. And this is a big project, and we want to make sure it's right. I don't know if that's their forte, installing cameras. Um, well, 
in terms of the contract, I, I just honestly, I can't recall if this is something that would fall under it. Um, or obviously maintenance does, um, upgrades does. I don't know if this will qualify as an upgrade or an installation of new equipment. Yeah, that's what I, well, I was hoping to get the answer to that, I guess, before going on this, because that'd be, I mean, $5,900 that we're already, you know, we're already paying that, so essentially we'd be saving $5,900. You know, if they put them in, are they gonna back, if something happens <clears throat> to the system, who's gonna back that up? Is, will the camera still be under warranty? I don't know, I mean, I mean, this company's backing up their product. If the IT puts in the cameras, it's not their product. They're just performing a service. Well, Able Electronics doesn't create the cameras either. It's not their actual product. But that's, but that's what they do. That's their living. They install cameras. Yeah. And where the IT, I, I don't even know if they, put, I don't even know if they install cameras. I, they just work on computers. And yeah, I was just curious. So, uh, I know we have a motion on the floor. Um, is there any reason not, would there be any issue with asking our IT department or I, IT contractor to take a look at this? Is there a huge rush to get these cameras installed quickly or? There's a time limitation. We would have to extend the grant. Um, we would have to contact the insurance carrier. I'm sure they'll, they, will, they will extend the grant because this is gonna reduce liability and um, I don't know if the price is going to be increased. I mean, it's hard to say. <clears throat> Assistant City Manager Fairbrother, um, I know you're, you're new to this IT contract, so I'm not sure if you have the answer. I know I don't, uh, as to whether or not this is one of their expertises. Sure. So I do not believe this is one of their expertise, and even if it were, um, my cursory review of the contract says that it's good for 2,000 hours of service, so essentially one employee for one year, um, as well as like one special project. So right now we're considering our special project to be the installation of uh, 105 new computers over the course of the next year, um, as well as the 2,000 hours is just one employee, basically eight hours per day. Um, I don't think that they would have time under this current contract to install these cameras. Um, admittedly, I have not asked because I, I didn't think it was going to be feasible. Um, if, if you'd like us to, we can. However, I, I don't think the answer is going to be that they have time. So, well, I guess so either way on the answer to that, I'd at least like to see a new invoice though for the licenses at least and see if that affects, well, I guess, yeah, it's probably not affecting installation since there's eight on there, but we shouldn't approve this amount either then because we'll be saving at least uh, yeah. $1,470, yeah. That's the amount taken off for? For 14 licenses. 14 licenses. Times 105. I mean, I, if, uh, Sarah, did you make the motion? I did. Um, we didn't have a number associated with the motion, but if certainly if council wanted to do that, uh, approve. But I guess I'd want to know why, too, we need to buy all new licenses, I guess. Is a uh, Mr. Devonico, I got one question. You said yeah. you have the invoice from 2015? Yes. At that time, did we purchase a um, processor? Or, um, I mean, a server? A server. Um, I don't think so. I don't. Yeah, so where do we save everything right now? Well, I'm, my understanding from it was that um, because we were purchasing a new server at this time, that's probably why we had to purchase all new licenses, is because the new server would be doing like the video for all the cameras in the police department. And that's the way I, oh. what I was thinking it probably was, why we had to purchase licenses for all of the cameras. And I guess my other question is too, would that server be using, doing the cameras in the court also or just the police department? 
these yes. current cameras that we're purchasing will be just for the police department. And I'm looking at the, the quote back in 2015. I don't see a server on there. The server we have is, it's old. But the server would, all, all the cameras would be hooked, connected to the new server, Yes, we we don't have cameras at the court, though. We, we, have, we have the capability, but okay. we don't view them. That's why I was thinking we probably had to purchase new licenses is for the new server to. Yeah. Um. But it is still not, if we only have 35, you're right, we should, it would be less. Okay. Um. Well, we have a, I, I actually do have one question before we move on on what, what we're gonna do. The um, uh, evidence locker, does that have cameras monitoring the outside of it or? Or yes, sir. We have it. one inside the evidence room, and they're outside in the hallway to monitor people that are going in or coming out. Okay. Um, well, we have a motion. I'm, in I'm fine with uh, what rescinding my motion. And just tabling till. And, and tabling it to the next meeting. Okay. Right. Is someone making a motion to table? Um, Mayor Pro Tem, motion to table. The approval to purchase high definition security cameras till the next scheduled city council meeting. Is there support? Support. Please call the roll. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Can I interrupt for a second? I have the phone number for the contact at ABLE, and I just contacted him and asked if I could call him. If you would just delay this vote, I can call him and see if I can get an answer tonight, or do you want to move on with the tabling? I, I think I personally, I'd rather just move on with tabling. Okay. Fair enough, sorry for the interruption. No. Thank you. Uh, please call the roll. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. Moving on to item B, approval of the proposal for architectural engineering services regarding the Memorial Park concession stand improvements. Mayor Pro Tem, I motion to approve the proposal for architectural and engineering services dated September 23rd, 2019 from AEW for both phase one and phase two of the Memorial Park concession stand renovation project. Support. All right, did anyone have any uh, discussion on this? Sorry, I kind of jumped that, but I'm really excited to finally get this done. <laughs> I was just gonna say the same thing. And that's <laughs> All right, please call the roll. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes, moving on to item C, approval to install new uh, so singular wireless uh, PCS antenna to the city-owned cell tower located at 16085 Nine Mile Road. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor Patem, I, I stated incorrectly, and before Mr. Rucci leaves, um, gotcha, uh, that the other providers were not paying fees, they are paying fees. Uh, I, uh, do you have any data, Joe, um, Mr. Mucci, on what fees other providers are paying compared to this? I do not. I asked uh, Randy Blum. We only we aggregate the amount that we we have. We have, we have at least two towers with, I believe, six carriers uh, total on the two. But he only it, it's lump sum, and I was not able to find the information with respect to each individual tower. But I believe on this tower there are four antennae existing, and this will be a fifth, but I think one is going to probably be coming off because of a merger. So um, I, I don't have the specific information. All right. Do we have a motion? Mayor Pro Tem, I motion to approve the agreement between new singular <coughs> wireless PCS LLC and the City of East Point to install a new antenna on the city-owned tower located at 16085 Nine Mile Road and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute execute all the necessary documents. Support, and then I guess, were you saying then, Mr. Cotton, uh, all this revenue is new, or this, is, or we're already? Uh, this is new revenue, there's no this doubt about that, but I, uh, I the others are it. also contributing revenue. I wanted to get okay. a comparison for you, and that's what we just mentioned. I remember some of it from when we had the Memorial Park one discussion. So I mean, it seemed pretty. It was something like this, right? Wasn't it? It was one thousand. I think this might be a little bit higher, actually. Five hundred. Remember, we negotiated back and forth for a while with. That I, one. I believe this one to be the highest. Yeah, I think this one is higher. Then let's pass it before. Uh... <laughs> All right. Please call the roll. 
Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. And Mayor Pro, Con Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. Moving on to item D, introduction and first reading of ordinance number 1176. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion? Sure, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I'll motion that we give first reading to and introduce ordinance number 1176, which amends chapter 28, offenses, article 12, municipal civil infractions, section 28-253, in regard to anti-smoke regulations and scheduled ordinance for second reading and consideration for adoption at city council's October 15, 2019 regular meeting. Support. I guess I did have a, a one question, which was how, in practice, we would expect to see this applied. Um, if it's just going to be, if like a neighbor complains, please show up. If they smell the same thing, issue a ticket. Yes. Okay. But it has to be. You know, we're not going to go there if someone's, let's say, smoking a marijuana cigarette in their back porch and it, the, you can barely smell it. It has to be something that's overpowering, you know. And, like, consistent, I'd assume. Or... You know, something that's breaking the property line because it's not fair for some people. I mean, some people like to have bonfires in their yard and they'll throw, you know, their deck in there. They're burning an old deck and the next thing you know it, they're, you know, they're breathing all the toxic odors coming from the wood I mean, something like that where it's, it's totally obvious. We're not going to go there with, you know, something that's just a faint smell. It's got to be overpowering and obvious that, you know, this is a noxious odor. And I agree with that. I just didn't want the potential for right. perhaps unfriendly neighbors right. to use this as a, as a tool. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I thought the same thing. I'm like, so. well, if you don't like your neighbor anymore, just start calling, you know, no, by the time the police arrive. Yeah, especially with... With now you can grow marijuana in the house and in a lot of people they go the cheap route they don't purchase the proper filtration system they just blow it out of a dryer vent and it's just you know it's not fair for the neighbor if, if they don't want to smell that but you're going to smell it trust me if they're doing it wrong so all right any other questions no. please call the roll council person demonico yes council person lacido yes Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld. Yes. Moving on to item E, introduction, first reading of ordinance number 1177. Would anyone like to make a motion? Sure, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I'll move and introduce, move to introduce and give first reading to ordinance number 1177, which amends chapter 18, environment, article 3, nuisances, section 18 48. In regard to nuisances and schedule the ordinance for second reading consideration for adoption at City Council's October 15, 2019 regular meeting. Support. All right, moved and support. Please call the roll. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. Moving on to item F, introduction and first reading of ordinance number 1178. <clears throat> Would anyone like to make a motion? Sure, Mr. Mayor, Pro, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I'll move to introduce and give first reading to ordinance number 1178, which amends chapter 28, offenses, article 6, offenses against public safety, to add a new section in regard to storage of firearm in unlocked motor vehicle and scheduled ordinance for second reading and consideration for adoption at City Council's October 15, 2019 regular meeting. Is there support? Support. Did anyone have any uh, questions regarding this one? I think this will be a good one, but I guess uh, it's... I guess I had one not question, but suggestion. Because we um, are passing this new ordinance, um, I think that we need to somehow definitely let the public know that this is a new ordinance in the city. Um, because I know that this has been an issue with um, firearms being stolen. So, because I don't want them to be surprised when they get this fine either, you know, because it's a new ordinance. So. I think a lot of them already know it's coming because we've talked about it. We're going to talk about it at our October 10th Neighborhood Watch meeting. I mean, when you have 11 or 10, 11 firearms stolen out of your unlocked vehicle in the last 30 days, that's not a good thing. Those guns are going in the wrong hands. They're used for other crimes, more violent crimes. And is this I, a real example? Yes. 
one I mean, person. Or we've had like we've had about ten to I'd say twelve complaints in the last thirty days about guns being stolen out of unlocked vehicles. We just had one today. It just it seems like it's never ending. You know, we are firm believers of the Second Amendment, but you have to be accountable for your firearm. You can't leave a firearm on your kitchen table when you have kids in the house. Why leave it? There's no reason to leave a gun in a car overnight. There's no reason at all. None. Especially unlocked cars. Right. And we've been preaching and preaching and preaching for the last four months now. Lock your cars at night. Keep your lights on. That's what we're preaching. And some people, they just don't get it. And they don't realize that these firearms are being used for violent crime. That's the only thing we can use them for. You know, I certainly wouldn't want my weapon stolen out of my car. The next thing I know, it's, it's used in a school shooting. I'd feel terrible. Yeah. You know, but this is something that, I, if I'm not mistaken, we may be the only city in, in Michigan. I don't know of any other city that has something like this. But we have to do something. And I, I agree with the it's very irresponsible to leave a firearm in an unlocked vehicle. Um, and then within that vehicle in an unlocked compartment. The question I have is, is this essentially really just going to apply to victims of theft? Because it seems to me that's the only situation where we're going to learn of this behavior happening. Typically, we won't find out if your firearm's stolen from your vehicle unless you report it. Now, there are some people saying, well, we just won't report it. Well, you are obligated to report that your firearm was stolen. You have five days from the from the time that you noticed that it was stolen to make a police report so we can enter the serial number in the gun description and lien so if, if someone comes across that weapon they know it's stolen from from the city and from that person it's uh it just you know if if you're a true gun lover and, and you know you're if you've been to the educational classes everyone's going to agree that you just don't leave your gun you know, a $400 weapon in a car at night, unlocked, and it can get in the wrong hands. We know all these cars that are getting broken into, not just in East Point, but across Michigan, if you read the articles, it's usually teenagers breaking into the cars. That's what they do. Or addicts. They go from car to car to car, check what's, what's unlocked, and they take whatever they can get their hands on. Most people keep their guns under the seat or, or tucked in between the seats. I mean, if you're going to keep your gun in your car, at least keep it in the trunk in, or in a case. They make all kinds of metal boxes you can secure them in or in a locked glove box. That's all we're asking. But, and that's why we're, we're going to test this out. And uh, the first offense is a civil infraction. It's not a crime. It's just a fine you have to pay. What's the consequence for not reporting a loss? It's a civil infraction according to the firearms policy in, in Michigan. You can get fined up to $500. Okay, so either it's you do it within five days and you're fined 350, or you'd be well, you'd be fined both, I guess, if yes, it was stolen out of your car and took. I mean, if, if your firearm's stolen, you have to report that. It's just like just like your car being stolen, you're going to report it. <laughs> just common sense. This is just common sense. It's common sense. And if you read the posts on the Facebook pages, everyone's in agreement. This is, this has to stop. People have to be more responsible and accountable for their weapons. Well, I don't think anyone's disagreeing with that. It's common sense, <laughs> yeah. to be clear. Um, I, I was just merely pointing out we are slapping a fine on someone who's reporting a, a crime when they have been a victim. The, uh, the last thing I wanted to ask is have there been, have we had cir uh, circumstances where there are repeat uh, offenders to this where they keep getting guns and they keep getting stolen out of their own un unlocked vehicle. Oh, that's None. what I thought you were saying a minute ago. Yeah, that's no, we're yeah. just talking about oh, okay. all the, just a variety of complaints come in. But no, there, to my knowledge, you know, to the ones that, let's say the 10 or 12 that were stolen, no, there's no repeat offenders. Oh, I because I, I would hope not. <laughs> because I, I actually think perhaps striking the jail time for a second offense, because your gun gets stolen, you're a victim, you should have locked it up, that was irresponsible of you. Right. I don't know if I'd want to throw someone in jail potentially for being a victim of a crime, even if they didn't lock their car and it you know, was risky because there was a firearm enclosed in, in it. But I don't know if counsel would agree. No? Okay. Uh, 
I mean, I'm fine with keeping it the way it is. I, I went back and forth with this, and I mean, like you said, there is no repeat offenders right now, so hopefully after it happens the first time, and especially with a $350 fine now, I don't think they'll be leaving their gun in an unlocked vehicle after that. You hope not. I would hope not. Right. All right. Please call the roll. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. And Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. Moving on to item G, approval of administrative plan changes. Uh, Mr. Cotton, did you want to speak on this at all? <clears throat> I, I do. Uh, the Civil Service Commission, of course, needs to uh, talk about this October 7th, but I, I thought council um, would, would best be first to um, review this matter with. Uh, basically, uh, the first item is what I consider just housekeeping. Um, we have a position that has not actually been uh, authorized by the Civil Service Commission. Council, of course, has it in the budget, and there's a title that's been given, but it doesn't really reflect the, the, pro the actual nature of the duties. And what I'm talking about is the duties that Mr. Mucci performs and I'm suggesting that we um, make it official. Parks, projects, and grants coordinator uh, position. There's no change to anything in the budget. There's no change to pay. Uh, it would simply be a, a title and going through the civil service process uh, with the expectation that it be um, viewed as an interim position until we see if there's other candidates interested internally, um, you know, following the civil service process. Uh, so that's that. Second one is uh, we have some changes. Uh, I think you probably know about them. Um, I assume so in the budget that the sidewalk program, uh, repairing those um, 100 miles or so of sidewalk uh, w was transferred to the Department of Public Works and Services. And also the building and facilities maintenance was transferred from the uh, Assistant City Manager's Office to the Department of Public um, works and services. Uh, that combined with your recent actions, which we very much applaud, um, hiring a, a construction inspector for the street projects uh, uh, it, and doing that differently than we have in the past, um, leads us to believe that a, a one person uh, with an engineering background could be hired and called a con construction services coordinator and be paid for through a variety of these other sources that used to pay for these other functions. We do not anticipate an increase there to the budget. In fact, probably a decrease associated with construction inspection. Um, so there are those two new positions, and then there's two job description changes. But why don't I pause there to see if there's any questions? Well, I think number one makes a lot of sense. I think number two, I guess, it seems like a hodgepodge of things into one position. Would someone, um, so they're doing sidewalks, we said, and then they're monitoring the buildings and facilities, and then also the um, like projects that, you know, our engineering projects. Mm -hmm. um, it we don't believe that there is a hodgepodge. Certainly the sidewalks and the construction inspection are, are same materials, concrete, mm -hmm. um, out in the field, out in the field, similar contractors. There's a lot of similarities there. Uh, the, so the facilities, the person is still out in the field going between buildings, needs to be uh, somewhat hands-on and, and w willing to uh, get up in crawl spaces or whatever is needed. So that's somewhat similar. Uh, I think our um, recruitment process will determine whether or not that expertise exists satisfactorily out there to, to still have them do those duties. But we believe that there, that, that there is that person based on um, some people that we don't have anyone in mind, but people that we have worked with in, in years past. And I say we, uh, Joe's an experience in Detroit, mine and my experiences with, with other professionals like this nature, um, I do believe they're out there. Can we get them in East Point is the question, and that takes the recruitment effort to, me, to see. <clears throat> so who does the city buildings and facilities work right now then? Uh, ever since Randy Altimus uh, retired, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, if Joe's still here, I'm not sure. Um, I, I believe it's been uh, solely Joe's and his crew, Department of Public Works and Services, as time permits. 
Um, we, they, to his credit, Joe's credit, we're looking at a comprehensive uh, light replacement project now, LED lights. Uh, so, you know, some of that uh, is needed. A lot more of that is needed, frankly. I remember all the discussions on the HVAC, as do other people in this room in the court building. Um, a lot of that stuff should have been proactively, and there's other HVAC needs that the city has, um, headed off. And with someone who's, who's focusing on it a little bit more than we've been able to in the past, will indeed be bringing stuff to us in a proactive manner, I believe. Why don't I continue under the job descriptions and, and circle back if there's more thoughts. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, Lori Hicks, and I don't think she's listening, but I, I do want to thank her for all her work to the city. She was administrative assistant for personnel in our office. <clears throat> she has moved on to a, a better pasture, and that leads us to advertise internally. There were no applicants, and that leads me to think that perhaps uh, this is a position that should be upgraded and upgraded in a way that would uh, produce more knowledge about what we do, so we will know more about what we don't know um, in that position and also uh, be a, a backup to Linda and also be more, um, more knowledgeable about purchasing. That person is likely out there, uh, based on my experience with interns, uh, such as Weiwei, four or five years, you know, you remember Weiwei, four or five years after that period when she was here, these people are looking for uh, jobs in HR or uh, some administrative position in municipal government, and that type of person I'm confident can be found. And if um, you agree, then I'm suggesting the position be assistant to the city manager, personnel and purchasing, and be uh, given a, a grade five, which is one grade above what the uh, former position was at. So the cost to the city would be between zero and $10,000, depending on the entry level pay for who was recruited. Sit in the same spot, do the same duties, but do them with a greater base of knowledge and an expectation of making municipal government their career. All right, are there any other questions or? No. Uh, the last item is to change the job description for recruitment of police officers and director um, is it, I, I should I should know this Rahib you butchered it uh, Rahib Rohib Rohib you know I am right. I need uh, to be hit with some wet spaghetti um, anyway would you tell us about this yes um, as everybody knows the law enforcement field is a dying field right now, and it's uh, just not in East Point. It's all over the all over the country. Um, we are having a very difficult time hiring quality people. It's just a different age. Um, there's other opportunities out there. I mean, the market's open. We're just having a hard time. So, what I would like to do is, you know, I truly believe in you know equal opportunity and diversity. We want to lower the standards a little bit. Instead of having an associate's degree to apply here, if you have any college, we'll look at you. But you have to have two years experience minimum as a licensed police officer. And uh, if, if you have military experience, we'll, we will also look at that. What that's going to do is increase our hiring pool and, um, and it, it, it'll give us a better opportunity to diversify the department. We, um, for instance, I had, uh, I had about three Detroit police officers, anywhere from five to seven years experience that wanted to work here in East Point. You know, they hear about all the good things that are happening here. They want to work here. Unfortunately, we couldn't hire them because one guy had 50 credit hours, one guy had 30, one had 20. But, um, and that just really cuts us short. You know, I would like to at least look at people and just see what the, what they have to offer. We can wash them in the oral board um, segment, or we have a 16-week field training program. If they don't make it, they get washed. Uh, unfortunately, we had to let three go because they, they couldn't make the program. But uh, I think this is a great opportunity, you know, for the city. There's many other cities that are doing this. 
we're trying to do whatever we have to do to increase our, our pool of applicants. And, um, and, and again, we have, uh, and we're always going to encourage college. I'm a true believer in education. We do have a tuition reimbursement program. Um, I encourage people, if they do want to get promoted, you know, one day they should go to college. They should get their degree. And um, I guess this is going to be baby steps. We're just going to see how this works. I mean, if this is approved, and we'll take it from there. So in practical terms, maybe would we be, we'd be able to get officers from Livonia, Roseville, Detroit, Harper Woods, or Hamtramck then? If... As long as they have a minimum of two years experience, full-time experience, as a licensed police officer. And if they came from the military, if they're a military, a vet, and you know a lot of the vets, they go to the police academy, and, um, but they don't have college, we would accept them. We would allow them to apply, and then we take it from there during the, you know, if, we don't, if they don't successfully uh, complete the uh, oral board, they will be uh, eliminated, or if they don't complete our field training program, they will be eliminated. But, it, but it's at least giving us a better shot. You know, sometimes, for instance, if we hire, if we, we post a police officer position tomorrow, we may have eight people apply, maybe. The fire department only had three. There's other cities like Warren and like Shelby Township they used to have two, 300 people on their eligibility list alone. Now they have 20, maybe 30. Same with Clinton Township. It's just, it's, we're, we're trying to figure this out as chiefs, you know, what to do. We're, we're just trying to make the job, you know, more exciting. You know, we're, we're, we're getting out there. We're making videos in our department. I just created a recruitment brochure that I plan on mailing to every police academy in Michigan, um, every college. So we're, we're trying. And um, we're getting better because I got to tell you, the last five, six, the last seven police officers we hired are excellent candidates. They're doing, they're all doing great. But I want to keep this pattern going on because in the next year and a half, half the department's retiring. You're going to lose all your lieutenants here. They're all gone. Some sergeants and some patrolmen. It's going to be a complete turnover. So I just want to make it, you know, it's, it's going to be a brand new department. And we just want to make sure that we're heading in the right path. And, uh, you know, obviously there's some people that can't afford to go to college. They can't afford to finish college. You know, that's unfortunate. But if they have two years of police experience, I wouldn't mind giving them a shot. So, uh, Mr. Cotton, I, I didn't look at our rules before the meeting. Um, do we typically vote on the description? I know that I, I, I thought that we voted on pay grade related issues, I guess I didn't think council had review over the actual individual descriptions. Um, I believe you are correct. I didn't spend a lot of time drilling down on that, but I thought uh, I would use an abundance of caution and put it all in front of you. Um, so if you want to modify your vote to simply pertain to what uh, you want to assume th that authority for, I'm comfortable either way. I was curious, what if we split up these four items? And we could, like number one, I guess, is what you're saying is, uh, well, you don't even necessarily think we have to vote on it, but I guess we could just yeah. support it. And yeah. then. Do we need to vote on any of them? I, I don't think so. That's why I was asking. I mean, Mr. Albright, I don't know if you have a different opinion, but I, I kind of actually feel like this is an issue that would go through civil service uh, and just not our, not our body. And then we would depending on whether or not we want to fill the positions, fund them or not fund them in the budget process. I guess three would be a budget amendment, I guess, right? Because uh, Depending on who's recruited, it could be, yes. Is there a reason that you would find it prudent for us to actually? Um, I, I don't, if you're comfortable not approving it, I'm I'm totally comfortable with that. I just want to make sure everyone is well, aware. I'm make a motion I, I, to approve it. Um, I'll just say other places I've been, it, it's called administrative plan changes, and council has, has uh, you know, made sure there is jurisdiction over that, so I didn't want to exceed my jurisdiction, uh, but that's your call.
I'm, I'm fine with just, you know, uh, I have no objection to some of the administrative changes and letting it just go through civil service unless council wants to. I'm fine with that. I think number one is number one is fine to me. Um, two, I don't know if I have more questions or I kind of maybe just need to think about that further. Um, number three, I guess, would um, I, I like the idea for sure. Um, I guess we would. Just need to modify be a budget issue or like you know amount of personnel the city has and then number four I think is definitely sounds like a great idea but also maybe we get the other council members uh, thoughts on that one too How long has Detroit been doing doing that? I know didn't they just somewhat recently changed to this to hire officers? Oh, Detroit's been doing this for years. You know, I other mean, cities like like how many like <coughs> ten years ago or probably more than more than ten years ago. Okay. So you think though he could just go forward with this, Mayor Pro Tem? Like that, all four items. I'm sorry, can you say that again? All four items. That's awesome. Could go Mr. Cotton could go forward with all four items with without coming to us, is what you were saying. Yeah. That's my position. Yeah. And if there's no motions or other discussion, then uh So that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna let administration go forward without a motion. Yeah, I guess Unless Mr. Albright has something you'd like to share, the council could make a motion. I mean, I mean, in the the recommended motion itself, it says that it's subject to the concurrence by the Civil Service Commission. Mayor Pro Tem, I'll make a motion to approve the administrative plan changes recommended by the interim city manager for a new parks, projects, and grants coordinator's position, and a new construction services coordinator's position, as well as upgrade the job description of the administrative assistant personnel position to assistant to the city manager for human relations and purchasing, and to change the police officer recruitment requirement education level to enable related experience, as well as subject to concurrence by the Civil Service Commission and future, bu future budget adjustments. Support? Yeah. Please call the roll. Councilperson Lucido? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. And Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. Uh, moving on to item H, court appointed attorney payment requests. And would any, did anyone want to start off speaking to this? Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, at our last council meeting, we, some information was brought to us that, um, of the possibility that we may have to make some adjustments to s some billing that was done through our courts. And so I think that um, this is something that we might need to move forward with approving. Uh, there's a report with uh, four options um, that's uh, attached to your agenda. I, I say report, but it's actually an email. So, option one I think is not an option. Um, Should we hear from the court administrator since she's here? Yes. Yes, I think that's right. Be... If you'd like to speak, good evening, Mayor Pro Tem and Council Members. My name is Karen Hayden. I'm the Magistrate Court Administrator of the 38 District Court. Uh, interim uh, City Manager uh, Mr. Cotton gave me a time guideline that it appears that Mr. Blum has typed out. 
Um, there are some discrepancies in this timeline, and I don't know really, to be perfectly frank, to kind of do a tit for a tat is really going to be the resolution. However, if I will have you flipped to the back part of the time guideline and go to June 17, 2019, Mr. Blum has my name indicated that I was present for a meeting. Mr. Sabata requested my judge that I be excluded from that meeting because that meeting was a two-prong meeting. Prong one was to discuss MIDC concerns. Prong two was to address salary increases for Heidi Terenzi, James Messina, and myself. So June 17, 2019 is an inaccurate statement. The judge and Mr. Sabata came to a reasonable conclusion that addressed issues and concerns May 6 of 2019, which is in the lower section of the front page. Mr. Sabato was aware of the increase from the $80 per hour due to the fact of the volume of the arraignments our courts do. We had several attorneys who originally appeared for the $80 an hour and after one day or two times appearing for the arraignments said thanks but no thanks. For 10 files, I'm only making $8 per file. It is in a living wage. So at that time, that discussion was taken with Mr. Sabata, and Mr. Sabata did not have an issue of the increase in order to maintain the current arraignment attorneys on our list. The court only found out that invoices were being not paid when attorneys were coming in when they received their adjusted invoices dated August 20th as to when the deductions that I believe Mr. Blum gave you guys samples of. So unless you really have a specific <coughs> question, uh, Jennifer Phillips from the State Court Administrator's Office did attend a meeting. She advised Mr. Blum that those contracts needed to be honored. Those attorneys needed to be paid in full because those invoices are deemed as a individual contract. They thought they were doing the arraignments at the $150 an hour. So I think, for, for me, I think option four seems the most reasonable, but also the budgeting part of it, I think at this point in time is not super, super important. But I guess, um, and option four is that we pay the attorneys and then edit the budget essentially for this roughly $9,500. When, well, so when did Mr. Sabota say he was okay with the 150 is what you're saying? Well, according to her, it was June 17th because that was me and you were not in attendance at and you said it, um, okay. Judge Gerds and him came to that agreement. Correct. So I guess my question is if that was on June 17th, I'm assuming that this difference in pay was already adjusted into their budget into the court budget because Mr. Sabota would have made sure they had enough money to cover the difference yeah. in the court budget if that was the case so I think we can just recommend to pay the attorneys the difference out of the court budget right now and I, I did want to ask you said it was a two-pronged meeting were you in any part of that meeting that day it was not I okay. met with the judge after the meeting Mr. Sabata I apparently felt it would have been uncomfortable for me due to the fact discussing my salary increase So, so then, and then so, well, sorry, I just got this timeline just now too, so I'm not, uh, I was trying to read I it before, well before, we, yes. before we uh, got to this, um, trying to remember it all. So then when, so d then we changed back to 80 then, I th this August 30th, September. or yeah, that l third from last, uh, well, from the way I understand it, is they've been only getting paid 80 cents October, or no, since May, or April 15th. I, I guess I'm asking, f at, at least at this point, since it's very, uh, from the standpoint of the invoices, I guess okay. then, uh, at this moment. <laughs> um, so that's when the invoices then change back to 80? Uh, on at the end of August. Beginning of the MIDC function, part of the grant indicated it would be $80 an hour. Yeah. 
We implemented the program March of this year. Several attorneys appeared when we initiated that. And again, with doing 10 arraignments, $8 a file, majority of the attorneys said thanks, but no thanks. We'll, we'll go to other courts as to where we're going to be compensated higher. At that point, it was a decision was made. Because originally, if you go back to the May 6, a lot of the attorneys tried to individually bill $80 per case as opposed to $80 per hour. Mr. Blum withheld paying those attorneys. Those invoices sat over here at the city. The court was under the understanding when we were signing off on them, the attorneys were getting paid for what was indicated on the invoices. Have we lost these attorneys then because now it's back? We've to lost 80. a couple attorneys originally when it was $80 an hour. Okay. And then I'll be going up to 100 right now. I guess. For the next fiscal or, budget, which starts October. Okay. I, I, I agree with um, Ms. Lucido's proposal at this point, and then if we have to if we get to a point where the court has to come to us with a budget amendment near the end of the fiscal year, that's something we could address then. I, I don't think anyone's in disagreement that the attorneys that worked and there was a representation to them on what they were going to be paid, that um, it's unfair to them not to honor those, those invoices. I, I agree. I think that we owe them the money because they were under the impression that's what they were going to be paid. Yes. And now that we're on the, all on the same page, and they had written, so it written doesn't happen again. Too, so. Right, that's okay. <laughs> say say they, were, they had written documentation saying that's what they were going to be paid. So, <clears throat> Yeah, Mr. Cotton, if we could, if we're going to not pay an entire invoice, we should definitely talk to someone or get that handled before just not paying the invoice. Uh, <clears throat> agreed. There is obviously a, 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 an understanding, we thought, a mutual understanding on August 1st. Um, but, right, we could have gone above and beyond on that and, and done better and, and not had some of these processes fall apart. So, um, point well taken. Okay. okay, and then Ms. Lucido, you said, so option two then, which is um. the... So yeah, I think it, it, that's what I understood. So, but I think this is worded though, as if there's not the money though in the budget, I guess, like you're you're saying, then right? You said Mr. Sabota should have had that in the budget when. I mean, you would think that he would have had it in the budget if that was the agreement. And if not, then what's going to happen? Then um, they would just have to ask for a budget amendment, which is in option four. But I mean, to make sure the money isn't. I mean, the way Mr. Blum says is that it wasn't. But it, if there was an agreement to pay that amount, you would think it. So he might want to double check that. I think right now we should just approve the amount. And then, like Mr. Kleinfeld said, if they need to do a budget amendment. Mr. Mrs. Hyde, the uh, Honorable Juror, um, Gerds and Blum can discuss that and make a recommendation to council for a budget amendment. Does it so if I understand it, I, I, there's the request in our tonight to um, designate, designate a number as part of the amendment process. Does that have to happen regardless? We can't just approve to pay it. There needs, does there need to be an amendment to put that to allow that money to be paid, or can we just approve payment? Uh, yeah, I think the motion should be uh, to uh, endorse option X, Y, or Z in the, the um, Wednesday, September 25th um, email, and with the understanding that um, uh, with subsequent approval of our but excuse me, approve option so and so as well as the budget amendment associated with that option. May I just it, make one statement before you do a motion? You should still have money laugh, left in the grant money. The city was allocated over four hundred nineteen thousand dollars. Out of that four hundred nineteen thousand, the city's portion is a little over fifty one thousand dollars. And the last reports that I saw, Mr. Blum 
and both uh, Councilman uh, Curdy and Sarah visited the court, and I did believe I showed them the fiscal reports that uh, Mr. Blum submitted to the state, and there's well over $200,000 still left in the grant money. No, you're right, but I, I don't think we can pay the difference out of the grant money because the, the agreement for the grant was for $80 an hour, so we're legally only allowed to spend the $80 an hour. Anything above that would have to come out of the taxpayers, you know, out of, the, out of our budget. That, that wasn't was, the that conversation was, I had with Nicole Smithson, who is now overseeing the MIDC for Macomb, <coughs> Oakland, and St. Clair. Um, I was present for several uh, meetings with Nicole Simpson, and I heard the limitation, as Councilmember Lucida said. The council would like to amend the budget. I, I believe Mr. Blum did a spreadsheet that was a little over $9,500. I don't have that spreadsheet uh, with me today. And I guess my, my question is, is that 9500 exactly what every invoice said because I know there's a part of time. I guess that's my question. The Are you timeline's referring? confusing. Um, uh, is this not, if we pay that ninety five hundred dollars, is every attorney going to be paid what every one of their invoices said, or is still a portion missing? Right. I think you're referring to uh, an attorney who emailed uh, Randy this afternoon. I think you got copies, perhaps that mm -hmm. said, yes, and uh, the answer is for that. One that we know of, uh, no, because the billing was for, I forget the exact amounts, but in our increments as opposed to the half hour that was actually spent. <clears throat> so she, her email is to suggest that she should get the hour uh, even though she spent the half hour. How was this not fixed before it came to the city then? Didn't uh, Administrator Haydat, you say that you double check them and then send them on to the city? Correct. So whatever hours you approve, is the amount of hours we should be paying? Correct. So, um, I think for tonight, and I know we received that email today, I would like to see if we can find copies of those invoices and review those invoices before we make a decision on that. I think we can approve this amount now, and that is something, because we just received those emails today. Well, that was, uh, I, I guess the other, that was, I guess well, that wasn't even what I was thinking about. I'm trying to think of, uh, this is very complicated to think about in my head right now. Um, the so there was a period of time where we were paying one fifty. Uh, let me see if I can just find it on the timeline here. Um, so October first, twenty eighteen. Right, right 20, was that the date I'm trying to think of here? Uh, I, I think I understand what you're asking. Does this make everyone whole, or are there other invoices that had the 150 80 discrepancy that's going to come back again? Is that? Yeah, essentially, and I can't think right now for some reason. I, from, going of, uh, through the, from going through the invoices, it seems to me it's going to make everybody whole because until April 15th, everyone was getting paid the 150, and that's when they changed it to 80. But then money was taken out, but that shows the, what the money was taken out on the spreadsheet that Mr. Blum Spida gave mm -hmm. us. So the money that was subtracted is shown on there out of people's checks, along with the changes from when they were charging 150, but we were only paying 80. That's all also listed on here. So we could make it, just in case something was missed, and Mr. Blum, if he looks and notices that it was missed and it gets brought to his attention, we could, you know, just say that we approve it up to ten thousand dollars, or not to exceed ten thousand dollars, to make them whole. I'd just like to motion to just pay what is on all these, all the invoices that came to the city that the attorneys assume that they were getting paid. And I, well, I think that's what Miss Lucido's suggestion right. would but you're only cover. cover like an extra 500 bucks or something you're saying then for that well, one i would hope that he wasn't that far there. off on what the invoices that he gave us i mean on what his configuration was I thought that, well so i thought there was a period of time though um 
Let's see. It, it is intent that you, of what you have in front of you to um, remedy the $150 versus 70 versus 75 versus 80, whatever um, amounts at, in 100%. It, depending on what option you select, that's how it will happen. Okay. The, the incident this afternoon with that memo, um, that email, uh, we will need to get our teeth into that and bring that back to you. Um, but this will at least take care of the 150 dispute. How, uh, okay, I'll, that sounds good for the point just now <laughs> that I couldn't articulate. Um, how, how do we even know that the hours was not correct if we just get the invoice and we just assume this is the correct, how, how are, you're talking about what we got today? The, yeah, the one today. I uh, guess that question, I don't even understand how. I, I think that's an invoice administrative question. The attorneys okay. seem to disagree with, and with what we have on our records. And without seeing an actual copy of the invoice, like I can't yeah. make a decision on that today without seeing an actual copy of the invoice. And that's why I was saying I think that's something we need to uh, request as a copy of that invoice before we can make a determination on that particular one today. Let's Are you talking about sure. Tanya Grillo's no. last email? No. I, mm -mm. I think it was uh, Freers. Freers, I believe it was. Ms. Freers? Dana? Okay. Oh. All right, so then we'll motion option two, I think, is what we've all agreed on, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. A motion we uh, motion approve payment for court appointed attorney fees is presented and direct the finance director to include a budget amendment uh, we'll say should we just say the 9501 or are we going up to the we can just do 90 that doesn't matter uh, I would just do 10 so yeah, that not to exceed 10,000 right, not to exceed 10,000 as part of the next amendment process uh, uh, in accordance with option two? Uh, yes, in accordance with option two. Sounds like good wording to me. Support. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Moved in support. Please call the roll. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. And All right, moving on to payroll and the bills. Would anyone like to make a motion? Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld, I motion to pay payroll and bills in the amount of one million two hundred fifty-eight thousand nine hundred seventy-one dollars and fifteen cents. Support. Moved and supported. Any questions? Please call the roll. Councilperson Lacido. Yes. Councilperson Demonico. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld. Yes. Moving on to hearing of the public. Would anyone wish to be heard? Mr. Creech. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and the rest of the council. I, I guess what I just boil down to is F, introduction to first reading ordinance of the article offenses against public safety and ordinances, guns. I made a statement in the last. <coughs> Well, I, let's, let's put it this way. I'll, I'll take this a little bit different. I think on this ordinance itself, because of me out there canvassing with the people, and I said, I made a statement, shoot them. And when I made the statement of shoot them, I thought my wife was going to lose it and everybody else. But I'm glad this was brought up because this is exactly what I'm talking about. A person should have no problem of being safe in their house. And yet, since I've been out canvassing, these people have been telling me they don't feel safe walking up and down the sidewalk. This lady the other day was a typical example. She was walking with her dog down along the sidewalk. A pit bull literally knocked the gate wide open. It took off after her. She was fortunate enough to get across the street and get in a neighbor's yard. Well, they called the police. The police come out. 
but the police didn't want to shoot the pit bull. So one of the neighbors dare again to come across the street, and they took it back, and they got it back to the owner. We have to do something. I don't know what it's going to take anymore for the people to feel safe. There again, too, as I said before, too, I carry a gun, and I want everybody who feels the same difference about it. It's your right, and I have this right in front of my house. It's your right to bear arms. I don't mean to go out there, and when I said shoot them, that was one incident. If I would have been there, I don't know, I probably would have shot the dog. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. I want to see this city brought back to what it's supposed to be, a full responsible. I want to see be able to, people be able to walk down their sidewalks with their dog. I want everybody to say, I've had some great conversations talking to these people. That's what I want to see this city. As I, you know, you, you can't keep doing this time after time where you're afraid to walk down the street. Let's, let's bring it back. And, uh, you know, if it's, if it's going to take that, but the, there again, too, I'm glad you said this. I said, please, people, don't leave your guns in your car. Don't, this, it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. Your gun is your total 100% responsibility. This gentleman, along with the police department over there, he has enough problems. He doesn't need somebody, anybody getting shot with somebody else's gun. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else wish to be heard? Oh. Christine Timmon, new in East Point. Uh, the people who are so scared of these dogs, would they spend one week in Detroit and see for what real fear is? I go all around East Point. I don't know where all this stuff they say happening. Or maybe I'm cute and people just don't want to mess. I don't know what the problem is, but I don't have any problems. I don't want, never had any problems since I've been here. And so I don't agree with that. And dogs are not people. They don't have any sense. I mean, sure, they may jump a fence, but that's going to happen. I don't care where you are. So I, I'm kind of sick and tired of this disparaging of East Point stuff when I've lived all over the country. This is one of the best places that I've been in. And I certainly don't want to leave, but I get so sick of every time I come here is somebody complaining about some race or something. And I just don't know where this is at. I just don't. I've had many cases in my lifetime. Do you know I have never used race? If anybody wanted to use race, the city of Lansing owed me $45 million. Three cases, they were flat out beat by the appellate court. When it gets down to the district, that's when you get a problem. They never listen to the Supreme Court or appellate. So it's still sitting there, and it's not a constitutional adjudication. So any attorney that can read, <laughs> it's easy to overthrow because the case is already done. They pleaded guilty, and they, and they got a, an immunity that don't even exist. But did I say, oh, my God, I'm black? No, <laughs> I've never done that. When I worked at Detroit Edison, this has been many Decades ago, did I go in there and say, I'm black? No, I didn't. I went in there and started typing and shorthanding and learning equations and stuff. I ain't have time to worry about what somebody's color is, and I'm just getting kind of tired. I don't know where I'm going to be able to go. Everywhere I go, I think I'm getting away from that and walk right into the middle of a hornet's nest. And this one here with this rank style voting, oh, God, it is so creepy. It sounds like some government scam it's just ugly you know so i i love east point i don't care what they say i've been all around all these areas everybody working all races creeds and colors these people making up all this mess and that is why when i go in that poll i got one person i ain't doing no rank i'm warning everybody else do the person that you like and don't we yellow green just leave them alone just do what you want to do for yourself, that's what I'm going to do. And the same thing for mayor. Next thing we know, it's going to be ranked mayor. Oh, God, no. Oh. I you know have 30 I seconds? Do. I know what I want to do. I don't need the city coming in time. I heard what she said, and then the city determined the race. They ain't supposed to. The people supposed to determine that race. So anybody that believes in that, I certainly, you know, hope the city of East Point is not subject to have to deal with any of those people. And uh, so I've made my choice. You can see it on my car. And that's the one thing I'm going to do. And I feel sorry for the other people who don't vote for him. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else wish to be heard?
Again, my name is Larry Edwards, citizen of the uh, residence of East Point. The thought of my symptoms returning. Uh, I think you can just close that. So I talked to my doctor, and would the American help Perhaps not. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I felt pretty confident that that would stop it. <laughs> I think I would have agreed on that. Put it outside. <laughs> again, my name right, is sorry. Again, my name is Larry Edwards, <clears throat> resident of East Point. Uh, uh, I would just like to start off by saying, first of all. Uh, I wish, uh, and I'm still hoping and have faith that more people will be more concerned in coming to these uh, uh, meetings such as this and what have you and other uh, uh, activities uh, and things because we got to be informed uh, on, on everything because too much is going on. Uh, but also beyond that, uh, uh, I heard that the signs uh, faded signs and old signs and what have you was going to be replaced. So uh, that was another thing that I had made mention on uh, was in regard to the sign for the blind. I uh, have not got a response or, or any uh, feedback in regard to uh, the questions that I raised on that that uh, have, uh, as long as I had been here up until I noticed that it was missing there on Gratiot right by the BP. Uh, station uh, is no longer there. So my question was that that at the other two times was uh, we do not have any more blind people uh, uh, in that uh, area, uh, or is it just missing, or or what is the uh, 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 deal with the sign not being there? Uh, if it was important at one time, then uh, 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 maybe it's still important now. But that's something I don't know, and so I was looking for answers that I haven't gotten yet. Uh, with the uh, two people that you had here for uh, this uh, ranked choice voting uh, situation, uh, uh, they, uh, it seems to me that only the, the ones that could address any questions uh, uh, in regard to uh, uh, before they was completed was just the uh, council. And uh, we, as a uh, the public take a lot of time out of our busy schedule, out of our time to come here to these meetings that are here and what have you, and uh, uh, it's coming out of taxpayers' money uh, to pay for them to even be here. We should at least, in my way of thinking and feeling, we should at least been able to uh, address a question or two uh, in regard to them being here on tonight. Uh, I don't feel like I should have to come all the way back again tomorrow or the next day and to address the question when I'm right here now. And what you have 30 you. seconds. And this is the part that I keep going over and over and over. The, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's about city. Uh, uh, what city wants, city gets, and what have you. And that's what the people are going to have to be informed on and realize what's going on, and what have you. When, when there's, it's, it's the residents and the public that's paying for everything, but uh, uh, being abused by, by all of it, and what have you. And so uh, this kind of stuff has got to stop. I heard mentioned that uh, education. Education does not, uh, is not equivalent or uh, does not equal uh, intelligence. Education is only something that is done for a- Your, a, your time is up, but I'll get it go ahead time. and finish that sentence. All right. <laughs> it's only something for, for someone to be uh, trained in a system that they are operating in or reformed in to be able to co comply with that system. It's not, it's, it's, it's not intelligence. In common sense, there is no more common sense. <laughs> All right, thank you. Would anyone else wish to be heard? All right, seeing none, the second hearing of the public is done. And we'll move on to council comments. Ms. Lucita. Um, first of all, um, to Mr. Edwards, if you do have any questions about the ranked choice voting presentation today, I'm sure Mr. Fairbrother would be able to answer those for you this evening. Um, and also, just to remind everyone that tomorrow night, we do have a ranked choice voting meeting located here at City Hall at 7 p.m. And another reminder about um, Thursdays, which is gonna be at the library at 6 p.m. 
The only other thing I have this evening is to remind everyone that the 8K Homeowners Association will be having a meeting on October 16th. It's going to be at 1 p.m. at the Community Credit Union located on Nine Mile Road. And that's all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. DeMonica. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Creech on the Director of Public Safety. Uh, we changed to that a while ago, and they are the Chief of Police and Fire Chief. And then that's why we have Deputy Chief Kaiser and Deputy Chief Nick Sage. And the city charter says that the city council can you know, amend the departments as we need to. It's in uh, section 16 in the organization area. Um, so it's been like that for a while, and uh, it's according to charter, according to law. Excuse uh, me, I'll, well, oh, I'll talk to you me. after the meeting, Mr. Creech. Thanks. <laughs> um, and Mr. Edwards, for the mayor and council question where you asked about the council being ranked choice voting and but not the mayor's election, that was the consent decree with the Department of Justice and we just had no jurisdiction to do otherwise. To me, it would have made sense to have both would have been nice, but that's what we were, uh, that, that was our agreement with the Department of Justice. So that's, that's why the city council election is ranked choice and the mayor's election is not. And in terms of ranked choice voting, I'm really excited. I think everything's been going very well. We had our county clerk here um, and the State Board of Canvassers also signed on to um, the tabulator we're using uh, for the election. So the state's behind us also. And even one of the members of the board suggested that they as a State Board of Canvassers, they send a memo to the Michigan legislature to try and get election law changed so that other cities can also do this. And then, of course, the federal government is on board with this uh, via the Department of Justice. So everything's going smoothly. Mr. Fairbrother's doing a lot here. And of course, we had our two folks here today presenting, and they'll be here tomorrow and the next day, as Ms. Lucido said. I'd like to congratulate everyone uh, from the Salute to Excellence for all of the awards that they won in East Point and Roseville. And on Thursday, there will be a Planning Commission meeting, and we'll have a public hearing for our medical marijuana ordinance. So if you'd like your voice to be heard, please show up at 7 p.m. in this same room right here. And then Fridays also is the homecoming parade and then football game. Uh, parade starts at 4 p.m. at the high school, goes to Memorial Field, of course. So show up to that. And then also there's a blood drive at the fire station, 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. on October 11th. You can sign up on American Red Cross website. I'll be there at, I think it was 5 p.m. I'll be giving blood. Hopefully everyone else can give blood. Red Cross really likes mine because it's O negative, so everyone can take it. <laughs> and I think that's it, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to touch on the um, briefly on the uh, ranked choice voting not being ap applicable to the mayor's seat. Specifically, in order to apply ranked choice voting, the, it has to be a multi-member district. And because there's only one mayor, you can't rank positions when there's only one seat up for grabs. Because we did discuss that trying to have a uniform. That's not true. I. Th you have to have. Most elections are um, just one winner. So. I'm sorry, I misstated that. There, there was a point. In order for the federal government to impose ranked choice voting and usurp state law, you needed to be able to be uh, have more than one district. Um, and that just is how the case law in the federal, I put, thank you for correcting that. I had it backwards. Um, and in terms of, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to move on for that. Uh, I do want to say I'm going to miss Lori Hicks because I think she was a great person in the office. She was always very cheery. I'm really sad to see her go, but I hope uh, she's doing well and I wish great things for her. Congratulations and thank you for being here for one year to Mr. Rohib. Um, You've done a lot in one year. I don't think anyone can dispute that, and the police department's doing great right now, and I know all of us really appreciate it. Um, thank you to Fred Miller for coming out to, to give a little input or update on what's going on with the county, 
and uh, I would like to say, um, share that the arts Shamrock Day went really well. There were a lot of children there. They did some artwork in the children's garden. If you haven't taken a stroll down there, you can go and see what some of the things the kids did on that day. And that's all I have. With that, I'll enter entertain a motion to uh, adjourn. So moved. Support. Please call the roll. Councilperson DeMonico? Yes. Councilperson Lacido? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Kleinfeld? Yes. Meeting adjourned at 9.25 p.m. <laughs>